Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And after he uh, had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town uh, in Samaria called Sychar, near the field uh, that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it? that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. He would have given you living water. The woman goes on to ask, Jesus, are you greater than my current reality? Are you greater than my current situation? Hey, if if you're here today and uh, you have brought something in that has made you uh, a bit thirsty, uh, we want to we want to welcome you. You are in a good you're in a good place. Obviously, the passage is much more than physical water, and so too will be the invitation to you today, if you have a longing or a thirst for something more than your current reality. Amen. Father, fill us with your Spirit that teaches and guides and meets us with this living water, Christ in your name. Amen. Welcome to our crew that is online. Um, We are so glad that you guys are here. We love you, and we want you to experience uh, what God has uh, for us here today as one large community. So thank you uh, for for being with us. Hey, let's let's break down this passage here. Uh, We're we're in this series called A Greater Invitation where we're looking at um, some skills, some competencies on sharing the gospel. We talk a lot about making disciples or, or seeing gospel advancement or seeing the kingdom of come, but the kingdom of God comes to his people sharing the gospel with people who don't yet know it, not just awesome like gatherings, okay? And so what we want to do in this series is help to equip you to actually do what God has called you to do, which is make that greater invitation to those around us. And so Jesus here uh, does it, and we're going to learn from that, and, and, and let's just always do some just basic biblical principles here, and, and we want to start with Jesus. You are always safe when we're going to look at Scripture, and you want to understand the Scriptures, you're always safest to start with Jesus, okay? I know it's the Sunday school answer. It's also the grown-up answer. It's also the answer in your marriage. It's the answer in your addiction. It's the answer in my anxiety. It's the answer in your parenting. It's the answer in your joblessness. It's the answer in your fatigue. It's always Jesus. So as we approach his word, we just, we want to start with Jesus, right? We want to be fair to how God has written his word and he's written it around a person. There is a hero of all the scriptures and his name uh, is, is Jesus. And so as we, as we, as we start with Jesus, the hero of this passage, we see that he is identifying himself as something. Does anybody catch it? What does he identify himself as? You can say it. Uh, you can say it louder with more confidence, please. Yes. Hey, by the way, I want you to know, like, the more you talk back, the more you give back, the more this thing, like, gets real, okay? So please, the quieter, is, that's not the kind of gathering we want here. We, we like babies. We like it. Thank you, Paisley. <laughs> You know, she said only if the Spirit hits Paisley will you hear from her today. And I think we just uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, right there. So listen, I want to, this is participation, okay? I want to invite you guys to experience God together with us, not just kind of listen and and, uh, wait for it to be over. So Jesus identifies himself 
as the living water. Uh, and even, even specifically, the, the living water, he, he alludes to it, uh, and then he, he gets into it a little bit more as the passage goes on. But, but the, the, the living water that satisfies. Um, should I keep going, Julius? And you'll let me know if I need to use another mic. Am I okay on the mic? Okay, cool, cool. Um, Jesus said, he's the living water, and he's the living water that satisfies. Now, the implication would be that there are other types of water that don't satisfy for very long. They might satisfy temporarily, but if Jesus is identifying himself as the living water that satisfies, that kind of like trumps all other forms of water, then there's got to be some other water that's out there that people are prone to go to. Matt Chandler, in his um, study that we do, we call it Rooted, but the actual study is called Recovering Redemption. He says there's four places that people often go to, when, four other wells, four, four other types of water when they're looking to be satisfied. They go to relationships, they go to religion, they go to the world, and they go to themselves. Okay, so in, in this uh, particular, particular passage, we see that this woman, she does some of all of that. First of all, relationships. As, as the passage unfolds, um, Jesus actually, remember, he kind of challenges her. He's like, well, I have what you want. You just have to ask. She then asks, and then Jesus goes right to her heart and starts talking about the fact that she's been looking for this living water in relationships. He, he goes into this husband thing. He says, go ask your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He's like, you're right. You, you, this is like your fifth guy. Like, you're very promiscuous. You've lived this life where you've looked for your water, not in a relationship with God, but in a relationship with man. You've gone horizontal with your thirst. And so Jesus, he, and, and it's, not, it's not just broken, that's sinful. Okay, and so Jesus, he just goes right after. He ne in the midst of his love, he never compromises uh, like his holiness. And he's like, look, the, the way you've been living is, is both wrong and it doesn't work. And, and so he, we see that this is a woman who was proficient at trying to satisfy her thirst horizontally. Now, in her case, there was like sexual per, or promiscuity. But it doesn't have to be sexual. It could actually be just wanting to feel included with, with friends and then having this great sort of um, like pain when you feel as though you were not included. You have like a fear of missing out relationally, or, or you're, um, you're, you're always dependent on the approval of others, and your world sort of crumbles when you get any kind of feedback, or, or those relationships start to bend, you, you can't handle it. What, what that means is that you're thirsty, which is a good thing. It's, it's just that you've gone looking for it in the wrong place. Well, some people, uh, some people go to religion. We're going to see here later in this passage that, um, and you, so... We don't have time to read the whole passage of chapter 4. I'm going to ask you to read the whole passage because you'll see, like the Berea, there's this church in Berea, as Paul was teaching, they would go and research what he said to make sure it's true. You should always do that with these sermons. So go and research to make sure, because I'm alluding to some things that happened in John 4, but go check it out to make sure it actually happened. So later in this passage, you're going to see that she's got some religion going on. Now religion is when you sort of um, get your efforts in order, uh, uh, in line to, to please God. So religion is like your best attempt to make it right with God. And usually religious people are pretty moral. They have a pretty high degree of morality. So, you know, like the, the, they don't, there's a lot of things they don't do in order to get God. And, and she um, kind of falls into that because she gets in a religious discussion with Jesus and she's like, hey, Jesus, you know, I know that, um, you, so Jesus goes after her heart, and she's like, whoa, you came in a little too hot there. Let's talk about religion. So she's like, I, you know, I know we're supposed to worship here, and what about this? And so she, she takes it to a religious thing, and Jesus brings it back to him. He's like, forget those details. Forget those details. Hey, what the Father is looking for is people who will worship him in, in truth and spirit, which means the Father is looking for people who know that the, the, they're sinners, and, and trust in Christ for their forgiveness and the newness of life, and, and then just submit themselves to his love and his grace and his goodness. That They have a submitted life to God that's based on the truth of his word and the Holy Spirit that lives within them, allowing them to live this new life. That's what the Father's going to look for. So we see that she had some 
kind of thirst that she was, she was trying to get quenched in religion. You might be here with that thirst thinking you're coming to the Avenue Church and, and getting that quench. Well, hopefully you'll find out we're not a very religious crew, okay? So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll quicken that lie for you and realize that we're not going to meet your religious needs here. Um, third, there's the world. You know, you can, look, you can look to the world. You could look to the stuff of the world to meet your thirsts. A lot, of, a lot of us might do this, even in a lesser, lesser form. We look to like the comforts and the convenience of the world. So we, we have this thing that happens in here and, and kind of like a gap of significance or purpose. We don't know what to do with it. It kind of gnaws at us. So we pour ourselves into our jobs or into our career or even into our family. These are all good things. They're just, were never meant to satisfy us. They were actually meant to point us to the one who does satisfy us. And, and so, you know, it doesn't really say a ton about her, her desires for the things of this world. Um, but what we know is that based on, on like understanding when she came out, that she was alone, that she had no community around her, um, she was probably a pretty marginalized woman, probably based on her lifestyle that was able to come out here at, at this particular time during the day when mostly women would come out in a community, and then she's chopping it up with Jesus. So she, she, it's not like she's got three awesome mops groups back here who are like holding her accountable and encouraging her in Jesus. She's definitely on her own. So as far as the world goes, it doesn't say that she's got a lot of stuff, um, but she's, she's certainly looking for the first two. And the last one is, is self. She's... I think she's, she's a pretty, um, maybe what you would say, faux confident person. Uh, I mean, the, just the way that she's presenting these questions to Jesus, she's, she's got like a, a foot forward, so to speak, and she's not afraid uh, in a culture where, where most women would not have stepped over some of these boundaries. She's not afraid to step right in and mix it up with Jesus. So she's got some, she, she's got some like um, maybe survival skills. She's a survivor, let's say. And so, and so there's, there's probably a good piece of her that's looking to herself to fill that need that only Jesus can fill. It's always good to start every passage with Jesus. Well, well let's, let's stay in context here. Uh, and, and Jesus says that he is the living water. The invitation is that for all who thirst, for all who thirst. So if we're going to do a justice to the passage, we start with Jesus, then we stay in context. And what Jesus is saying in this passage is that everyone is invited, especially when you look at the Samaritan woman. So she kind of fits all of the uns of the world. I, I wrote down a few. Um, well, actually, this is kind of how the phrasing started. Jesus is the unexpected king for unexpected people. And so she meets that. She's ungodly. She's unhappy. She's unwanted. And she's unseen. Now, now if you can relate at all to any of those things, you need to know that Jesus is the king for you. If you can't relate to any of those things outside of Christ, like, so because Jesus, he helps us to undo all of those things. Like, we become happy in Jesus. We become wanted in Jesus. We become um, seen in Jesus. But if, if, you, if you feel like you have all that and you don't need Jesus, then, then he, he, he's still your needed king. You just don't know it yet. And the prayer is that the Holy Spirit would, would open your eyes like he did the blind guy last week. But I love this because it's an invitation for all of us who experience the unfulfilled thirsts of this world that leave us feeling like this woman did. Jesus is absolutely the unexpected king who hangs out in the wrong places and offers the kingdom to the wrong people. If you are someone where the, you've received the kingdom of God by trusting Christ, well, then you, you know that you were the wrong person too because you, you were an enemy of God at one point. You were the prodigal still out there and until the father wrapped his arms around you and brought you close, you would have stayed out there. So technically you were the wrong person until he made you the right person. I love that about the father. That's how the father, he pursues us with that relentless love. And the context of this passage is that the living water is for all who don't think they deserve it or are even looking for it. And then finally, step into now. Step into now. So th this, is, this is where we get to invite you guys, like Jesus did, to receive the living water. This is what Jesus says in this passage. Um, 
if you would have known who's offering the living water, you would have asked and, and he would have given it to you. See, because the woman, she has this, this inner, this inner uh, change with Jesus where she's like, man, I would love this living water because I don't like coming back to this well. You know, it's just kind of an inconvenience and things like that. And so what Jesus is doing is he's, he's hearing her story and then he's entering. She's kind of still on the surface. She's like, oh, sweet. You're like the Culligan man? Awesome. Sign me up. You come by, deliver water. I don't have to come back here anymore. It's going to be great. It'll give me more time to pursue my other thirsts. Jesus hears her and he goes into the deep end. He's like, if, if you would have known who's talking to you about this, you would have asked him and he actually would have given it to you. He's like peaking her curiosity as he listens to her and, and unfolds kind of what's going on here. I, I, I never thought about the fact that curiosity is such a great way to, to engage people. I was, the, com one of the, the commentary I was reading was, was talking about the, the idea that Jesus, um, he engaged her curiosity. Like, he didn't give it all at first. Do you notice that in this passage? He, from the, from the very first thing he says is not, I'm the Messiah. He enters into her drama so that the Messiah will eventually make sense in her story. Are you, do you, you see that, right? He's, he's, not, he's not ready with just a quick presentation so he can get on with the business of ministry. She is the ministry. She is the priority. And if she and people are the priority, then the way we listen and engage has to get better than probably where it is today. Step into now. Before we equip, because we're going to equip here in a second, we're going we're to do a little bit of a shift into some equipping as we look at this passage. Thank you. Do I sound a little thirsty? That is amazing. Look at that. We're tied. We didn't even plan that. Matt Corwin. Let's give it up for Matt Corwin. I was actually thinking I'm, I, I don't have a water today. That is so cool. And, and like we, living water, we ask, oh my goodness, this is awesome. Wow. I wonder what's going to happen next week. <laughs> so, you got to think about that one. So you, you came in here thirsty. Whether you know Jesus or not, you came in here thirsty. Because a person knows Jesus, and when I say knows Jesus, what that means is they've understood that they're a sinner, and that God, God should and will crush them outside of Jesus. But Jesus got crushed in their place and overcame that, that penalty for their sin. And because he overcame it, now somebody like me can over. I'm, a, I'm an overcomer not because I'm awesome, simply because I've just trusted in Christ. I've just, I've turned my life to Christ. He's my treasure. He's my king. And I'm like, it's either you or nothing. And what I'm seeing is it actually is him and it's everything. So if that's you, you're thirsty. I'm thirsty this morning. Like, like I came in here. I know Jesus. I love Jesus. Worshiping in the morning, but I'm, I'm thirsty for Jesus. I'm thinking about this moment, thinking about what's happening. I'm thinking about, man, you know, like um, I just, I never seem to always get it right when I want to get it right. You ever, you ever experienced that? It's like, I'm getting it right over here when it doesn't matter, when nobody's like watching, but now I'm going to try to preach to a couple hundred people and it doesn't seem to be able to, I can't get it right in the moment. And so I've got this big performance idol that's like hounds me. And he's like, hey, you know, you know, you're not thirsty for the perfect sermon. You're actually thirsty for me. So just ask me and, and I'll fill you. So if you're a believer, you're thirsty. Uh, there's things in your life that are helping you to understand where your thirst is. And, and I'm just inviting you, just ask Jesus to fill you up with more of Jesus because that's really what you want. If you don't know Jesus and you've come in here, and you're not exactly sure why you're here. There's some stuff going on in your life. Maybe it's really pressing. Maybe it's not. Maybe your life is awesome. Let me just be the first to lovingly tell you, you're really, really thirsty. And Jesus is, listen, listen, Jesus is inviting you specifically to respond by simply asking Jesus to fill you with the living water that we're talking about right now. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to come forward and say this and do that and like, you know, somersault back to your chair like your life got changed. Just right now, just right now, receive the invitation by the power of the Holy Spirit and just say, Jesus, I'm thirsty. 
would you please fill me with that water? And he will, and he will. Because you can't give away what you don't have. And so we're gonna take a look now at, at, at wh- wh- what would it look like to, to be better at giving this away? You know what's cool in the Christian life? To camp out in grace, and grace doesn't make you lazy. The, the deeper dive you do into God's love, the actually, actually the more effective you become for God. You don't, you don't become like proficient at lazy boy Christianity. The more you realize that you can't, it's done for you, you're accepted as you are in Christ, you're as perfect as Jesus is. I'm gonna say that again. You need to let that wash over you, Christian. You are as perfect in the eyes of the Father as Jesus is because of our union with him through faith in his finished work. The more you rest in that and believe that, more effective you will be, the more you will want to go, the harder and further you will want to carry the gospel from that point of rest, not that point of striving. And so I'm going to invite you to rest in the living water, but then I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully, I'm asking the Spirit, Spirit, help equip us to be able to, to, to listen and to engage in ways that maybe we're not normally used to, to listening and I wanted to start with an exercise, okay? It's gonna take 30 seconds. So here's, here's how the exercise is gonna work. And first of all, let me just preface this with, if you're a baby in the room, I don't mean emotionally. I mean like if you're a literal baby in the room, you can, there's no reason to like try to muffle them, make them be quiet or anything like that. So we, we want them, we wanna hear them if, if they wanna say something right now. But we're gonna take about 30 seconds and we're gonna do a listening exercise. And, and it's just gonna get as quiet as it can be. And I want you to try to pick out three distinct sounds over the next 30 seconds. We're just gonna be quiet, you're gonna engage listening, and I wanna see if you can pick up three distinct sounds over the next 30 seconds. Ready, go. I heard a baby here. Hey. I heard another baby here, and then I heard the creak of the door. You guys maybe heard some, some other stuff. Computer, wow. Wow, we heard a computer beep. What else did we hear? Come on. AC? Okay, cough. Cough, cough. White noise. White noise. White noise. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so here's the thing. It's, it's, um, it's a little awkward, right, when we, when we get completely quiet in here. It's just, it's slightly, even though I set it up, it's slightly awkward because we, uh, and we, when I say we, I'm going to start with me, we're just not good at getting over ourselves. And so for us to get over ourselves and be fully present in the moment, it almost seems weird if we all did that together. It's, it like ushers in this, this quiet and we're all expecting noise. And if we don't hear noise outside, we're willing to make the noise ourselves. And so noise is our constant posture. And so it becomes very difficult for us to be proficient at listening when we hardly ever like necessarily do it in an intentional way like that. Our world is noisy. Our insides are noisy. Those are all kind of part of the shalom, the peace of God that was lost in, in sin. There's still like a constant buzz. Even in Christ, there's still a constant. And, and I just want to do that exercise to show you the intentionality it takes to listen well, but when you do listen well, you can pick up things you would have never picked up before, like sounds of the AC growing and the beautiful, beautiful noises of our babies. So what does this look like? Well, first of all, place at the table, right? This is a series about evangelism, and it's a series about um, how we take the gospel more effectively out. I feel like I've shared the gospel for almost nine years. You know the church is almost nine years old? Like this September is nine. It's crazy. It's crazy. I've, we've, whoever's been up here has shared the gospel faithfully for nine years, but I don't know that we have equipped faithfully others to share the gospel. Like you've heard it, but you haven't necessarily heard the equipping for you to do it. 
And so that's a shift for us um, as, as we think about this new culture is equipping you to do this because that's, that's where we see the amount of Christ followers double, which is part of Vision 2020 and, and, and what Church United and, and this church is, is, is about. Um, and so anyways, what's our place at the table? In this series, we've been talking about a place at the table and where is it that it makes sense for Christians to sit? And it's a different culture and, and things like that. But one of the ways that... that um, that's changed, and we talk about this every week, is we don't necessarily carry the same place in society the church carried 50, 60, 80 years ago, where, where cities were actually built around the church, you know, even way back. Now, the churches are like literally museums. Like if you go to New York City, you might see first fill in the blank, or you might see metropolitan art fill in the blank in an actual church building. And so the church has somewhat lost its place that it used to have in culture is just as far as like sort of the moral compass in the way that people look at the church. We, we still have the moral compass. Like it, Jesus is still on the throne. It's just that it's not quite acknowledged as it used to be, at least at the table. And so as we talk about wh where is our place at the table, the church and believers, they still have a very significant place at the table. Last week we talked about storytelling and understanding, hey, so, so we don't just come in and assume that everyone has this Judeo-Christian worldview and assume that that's the predominant. We can't assume that anymore. We've got to actually survey the land and, and figure out what, what makes sense in this particular context, in a post sort of, sort of churchy context where, where not every average American goes to church on Sunday. Where, where does it make sense? Last week, we talked about the importance of your story. This week, we're talking about the importance of other people's story. Because if Christians still get to tell their story, which I did this week, was it awkward? Yeah, it's kind of awkward. I actually used, like, hey, our church is learning how to tell the story, and then, I, and then I, I launched into my story from that. Because there was no, like, awesome, smooth way. You know, you know how you always want to, like, share the gospel in a super smooth way? Like, you didn't even know I had to share the gospel. And, like, I, and it's like, whoa, what happened? So I couldn't find a way to, from, like, hey, the dolphins are really bad, but you want to hear a good story. Let me tell you mine. Like, I, it didn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't happening. So I just was like, hey, our church story, and, and, like, I don't have I ever told you mine. And then I launched into telling my story. And it was really cool. And, and the person I told my story to actually engaged with one of my pain points. And then I actually got to take it a step further and talk about how that pain point that he's experiencing can only be filled by Jesus. I would have never said that in just normal conversation. And he was able to say, wow, that's kind of like far from me. Or like maybe translation, I'm not ready for that. And, I'll, and I was able to like say, yeah, okay. You know, cool. <laughs> Love you. I didn't say all that. I just alluded to that. Like, I got you. Okay, great. So, so that's still a place at the table. Another place at the table is other people's story and us being able to listen proficiently. Gospel listening is kind of today's uh, equipping, if you will. So uh, Metzger... Uh, he, he's, he's got this idea. I want to give, give him credit. He's the one who, I'm crediting it him because it's his idea. That's what you should do. Uh, he has this uh, framework for listening that's based on God's story. And, th and this is how it goes. So we know that God's story from last week goes creation, fall, redemption, renewal. Everything's good. Everything's bad. God comes in and rescues us through Christ. And God will come in and, and, and finish complete rescue when Jesus returns. This is God's story. There are different pieces of this story that are actually being lived out in other people's real life stories. So there's, there's sort of an ought that everyone, whether you're a Christian or not, is living out. You will need the handout today or you'll need to take notes or take a picture of this if you want to try it. Um, and it, it's super, it's kind of it's awesome. Not because I did it. I'm obviously giving credit to somebody who's not me. So, but it, it like works. Okay, if you don't have an outline today, because our printer, it ought to work, but it didn't. <laughs> okay, so the, so, so the redemption is the outline is on the app. So if you open the app, you can have the outline. We also posted it to social media, Facebook and Instagram. There's a picture of it. So open it up. Go ahead and do that right now. So here, here's, here's what he's trying to do here. He's saying this is God's story. This is also everyone's story. 
And everyone, everyone's story has an ought. Like, things ought to be different, at least to a degree in my life. Like, I ought not to have anxiousness. Like, you ought not to be uh, in, in the midst of a marriage that's really difficult. Like, you ought not to struggle with addiction. Like, like you ought not to be short on finances. Whatever. whatever, the, whatever. There, there's an ought. Things are not really the way they're supposed to, to, to be. And, and so, uh, because in creation, everything was awesome. But, but now everything's not awesome. And so the fall, the fall is kind of, remember from, well, if you weren't here last week, check it out. But the fall is like, what am I doing to try to redeem my situation? So everyone in their story, they kind of have an ought, but then they also have an is. And there is, is like their current reality. When they give you the details of their current reality, their current marriage, their current finances, their current struggle internally. Okay, so, so the ought and the is often go close together. So when somebody's telling you how difficult it is or, 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 or you know, how painful it is in their world, we as, as believers, man, we get to affirm that. We get to hear that and we get to also affirm things actually aren't the way they're supposed to be. You're right. So when you feel this way, you're right that you don't like how it feels because you actually weren't created to feel that. You weren't created to experience that. That's, that's the, the brokenness of sin that you're now tasting. There's a, there's a can. This is, this is redemption. And so th this is, in somebody's story, it's what can happen in order to fix it. Everyone has a can. Every story that you're listening to, every relationship that you're in, there's going to be a can, and it's up to us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to recognize what other people's cans are. Like, I can do this, and then everything will be fixed. I can change, or, or, or I can change my spouse, or I can make more money, or I can take some pills that'll make this go away, or I can, can, can. And so... What we're doing is just simply hearing for the can. Where are they looking for redemption? And then finally is the will. One day, after I've figured out my can, everything will be back to normal and I won't be so thirsty anymore. Let's look at it uh, from this uh, lady's perspective here, um, just to keep it in context. Uh, so if, if um, again, if you have your Bibles, we're in, we're in John chapter 4, and if not, we've got some verses for you to follow along. Um, so her... Her ought um, is in verse 9. You can see it. And she says, um, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samar Samaritans. Things are not as they ought to be. Like she's experiencing prejudice and racism. And she realizes this is not right. Even though she's saying like Jesus, you know, I'm confused. Why are you even talking to me? I'm a woman. I'm Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews hated each other because the Samaritans were actually, I learned this, preparing for this, the Samaritans were actually left. They were left in the land when, when the Babylonian captivity took place because they were considered to be the, they didn't want them. They were like the lower society. So they get left here, all, most of Israel's over here, and they start intermarrying with other people who are not Jewish. So, so now you've got like the lowest, in, in, in that economy, uh, in the way that they were looking at them, the lowest form of society now is in, uh, like intermingling with other religions. And so when, when the people come back, like, like the Jewish people are looking at the Samaritans as though you don't belong to us. First of all, you're low class. Second of all, you've sold out by intermarrying. And so you're unclean and unwanted. And there was like, and you can imagine how that makes the Samaritans feel, right? Like not warm and fuzzy. And so, so they have this like prejudice and hatred and it's and so the woman is picking up on it. She's like, things aren't as they should be. And she, she offers that to Jesus. And Jesus is listening. And, and then we see the fall. What is her fall? Verse 12. Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself. As did his sons and livestock. This is her is. This, this, is her, this is her reality. Like, um, you know, we've got this well that I got to keep coming back to, and I'm thirsty. I I'm, I'm just have resigned myself to the fact that I'm always going to be thirsty. Are you, are you greater than my reality? 
You know, because this reality has defined me and it's defined my family and it's defined our people for years. I mean, you've heard this, right? Like, hey, I'm just fill in the blank. It is what it is. It's my Irish blood. It's my Italian blood. Hey, I'm just filling the blank. I'm of this. I'm of that. And, and people are used to being defined by their heritage or, or, or even by their current reality, even if it has nothing to do with their heritage. It's just who I am. Well, what's her can? Um, it, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come back here um, to draw water anymore. And so she sees a quick fix with Jesus. She's like, hey, if you can do this for me, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my happiness restored. I won't be thirsty anymore. Like, you'll take care of one of my problems. And so she's got a can, but she's not looking to Jesus for that water that really satisfies. She's looking for Jesus to make her life more convenient. Almost like, wow, it would be super awesome if you can keep me out of hell, Jesus. Sign me up for that. But dying to self and following you, ooh, I, I'm not looking for you for my redemption like in that way. I just want to feel different. Well, what's her redemption? Oh, I'm sorry, what's, what's her ultimate restoration or her renewal? I know, look at verse 25. I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he, he's gonna tell us all things. So, so she's, she's got this, um, this thing that could happen or that will happen, and when it happens, everything will be back to normal again. She won't be as thirsty again. So she know there is a hope, there is a future, and it's in some distant Messiah that she's heard about, and so she's kind of she's hanging on for that. And at that point, her happiness will return. She won't, you know, everything will kind of get worked out. And, and, and this idea of greater invitation, I love what Jesus says. Look, look, I want to read his words. This is what he says. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I, it's a person. I who speak to you am he. This is what you need. You need me. You don't need another program. You don't need a better sponsor. You don't need to up this or do that. There's nothing wrong with those sort of improvements that help you along the way. I support and say, champion, if you need medicine, if you need this, a pro, that, those are all awesome things. They're just going to continue to make you thirsty if they become your ultimate things. If those things don't point you to the person of Jesus, well, then you're going to get in line behind this woman and have to keep bringing your, your little bucket back to your well. Should I clap? I don't know. He was yelling. Is that? I don't know. Was he mad? I'm not. Is, is, do I clap when he's mad? He's not. I don't think he's mad. He's just like, I don't know. He's confusing me. He needed a drink. My wife tells me I can't yell all the time. So, baby, I saved it. I haven't been yelling too much today, okay? I don't think. I who speak to you am he. Hey, let's make this real and then, and then let's, let's worship the living water. We're going to be a practicing community, right? So let's see this next slide, please. Creation. This is, again, you wanna, it's going to be on your outline. Maybe take a picture of this. We're going to have creation fall and then we're going to have redemption renewal. And then we're going to be done. I want to, I want to show you how this works out, right? Um, well, there's a super awesome ending. So, so there's one little last piece. Creation, ought. Things are not as they ought to be. So these are listening cues for you as you approach these relationships, especially with people who don't know Jesus. If they do know Jesus, they're going to need you to listen like this as well. I need you to listen to me when I talk to you about myself with this lens. But, but, but so do the people who don't know Jesus. And so as they're telling their story, as you're entering their story with love, no, speak. Okay, let's try that again. With love, no, speak, do. Okay, that was, the, that was our first one. Um, you want to listen with these type of ears. So what is not as it should be in this particular person's reality, in their story? Secondly, what is their reality? Get details. Like care. Care about somebody's reality. Oh, well, how did that make you feel? What was that like for you? Try to avoid yes, no questions. Have a posture like, man, I'm leaning in. Like, I'm, like right now, some of you, 
Some of you are like, man, you like this or you like this. I've, we're engaged. Some of you are like, it's, it's totally cool. You're welcome. But, but there's a different vibe that we're giving each other right now. Just like if I preach like this. So you got like living water. You should drink it. And, um, you know, if, you, if you, Jesus is it. Listen, there's a different, when you listen. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to yell, baby. But when you listen, it matters, man. I did it. Sorry. It, it matters how you, like your posture, dude. It matters, okay? It really matters how you listen to somebody on a personal level. Okay, so, so get their reality. Now, now watch this. Um, yeah, let's finish this part, and then I'll take you through it all in one shot. Redemption, can. What is, what is it that they're looking for? that can change, that will like make their world better again. So sort of like, if only I can fill in the blank, whew, things will be better again. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us as we listen for that. What, what, what's, where's their hope? What, what are they pinning? Like if this happens, oh, there it is. That's what they're looking for in their redemption right there. Oftentimes, it won't be a person named Jesus. Just remember that. And finally, will. Then, well, then I will what? What are they longing for? Then I will be happy, or then I will um, not be angry, or then I won't feel this way, or then um, I won't struggle as much financially, or then, like, there's, there's something, there's some sort of functional, like, heaven on earth that we're longing for. And oftentimes, it might be, like, emotional. Like, what, what, are, what are they looking to get out of getting this whole thing fixed? So can you go back to the last slide, please? I'm going to run through it real quick. Watch this. So uh, you're dealing with somebody who is uh, walking through a divorce right now, right? And um, this is a person, they don't know Jesus. And so um, they're talking about how uh, painful it is and how they feel abandoned. And so um, their ought is that God created marriage to last forever. Adam and Eve were never supposed to be then separated and like trying to work out their differences out here and remarried and remarried. Like, like it, was, it was supposed to be right here. It was a forever, supposed to be a forever thing. Before sin entered the world, there was no disharmony between relationships. And so you can affirm their pain, even, even if they're the one that has caused most of it. You can affirm the fact that, you know what, you're right. Things are not as they ought to be. You, I, the pain that you're walking through, it's super, super valid. Like that wasn't, that wasn't what marriage was created for. You're disappointed in marriage, rightfully so. Secondly, what's your reality? What is it like for you? Can you, can you explain to me a little bit about the pain that you're experiencing? Because I'm not divorced, so I don't understand. Please never, never say I understand. I mean, at some point, if you do understand and you feel like in the midst of the conversation, it'd be helpful, but definitely not early. Because you don't under, even if you have fill in the blank, you don't understand my version of it. So don't like dishonor me by saying that we're, we're, you totally get it. Just ask me more questions about what it's like for me and engage in my reality. Okay, so it's really painful. I feel over, I feel abandoned, just like my dad abandoned me. Just like, this isn't true of me, obviously, but just like my, you know, whatever. Just, just like I, I grew up, I'm now experiencing. Next slide, please. If only I could, man, if only I could be a better spouse to win them back. Oh, oh if only I could have implemented the things that she asked me to implement earlier. If only I could have, man, Man, we wouldn't be in this situation. Man, as, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go work harder on it. I, I know she doesn't want to do marriage counseling. I'm going to do marriage counseling. I'm going to do everything I, I, if, if, the, man, I know if I can change, I can win her heart back. And then if she comes back to me and this marriage works out, I won't feel lonely and abandoned anymore. She'll actually complete me and I can get back to my life. As you prayerfully listen to somebody who's walking through that, validating them, what you're doing is you're asking the Holy Spirit to give you the opportunity to gently lift their eyes and help them to see that they're looking for good things, but what they really need is another person who's not a part of their marriage whose name is Jesus. 
He will satisfy the longing, the abandonment, and all the issues, at least from that perspective, that, that, they're, that they're looking to find fulfillment in, in the restoration of their marriage. Their, their, their longings for this marriage is a good thing, but what they need is Jesus to come in and give them the living water that could then send them back into this marriage, not needing the other person, but free to love the other person. And so it's your responsibility to gently lead them to the person of Jesus rather than just a better marriage. As you look specifically and especially at what they're looking for to make it better, that might not be him. Jesus, so I'm gonna ask the team to come up and we're, we're gonna... We're going to sing and we're going to praise Jesus. But I wanted, to, I wanted to finish with a question. And here's the question. Here's the question. Prayer partners, would you come up? Because this is going to be our moment to receive people if they want prayer. The question is this. What if we actually started inviting people to Jesus rather than things that will make them thirsty again? What if we became a community that actually lived this out, this greater invitation, and we became better at inviting that person who's feeling abandoned to a God who will never abandon them? What if we were to hold out the good news of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection as not just forgiveness of sins, but in addition to forgiveness of sins, a God and a father and a lover who will never leave them nor forsake them, who will actually quench that thirst for relationship that they've been looking for in their spouse that's probably driving their spouse away? Jesus is the good news that they need, Amen. not a better marriage program. Can it help? Sure. But what if along the way of getting that help, we started inviting people to the person of Jesus rather than just another thing that will make them thirsty? As we sing our last song, I, I can tell you what, what might happen. Verse 43, this woman goes back and she's like, man, Jesus, he's the guy. All these people start believing because Jesus healed her. No, because Jesus fed her. No, because Jesus like elevated in the air and did some miraculous thing. Listen, he listened to her. Okay, he listened to her and he knew where the kingdom would make sense to her heart. Verse 42, after the two days, he departed from Galilee. He testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So he goes, he, go, he goes on. That's not what I wanted you to read. <laughs> I wanted to read verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. We're going to invite you forward for prayer. We're going to invite you to stand and sing to this Savior of the world who is continuing to save through people who listen and engage his gospel message. Please come visit our MOPS team. They want to disengage you and invite you and help you to invite some other people. So they'll be here. Our prayer partners will be here. If you want to come up here a little bit just after if you were waiting and you want to come up. Hey, thanks for being with us today. If you're comfortable, turn your hands like this. I want to ask a blessing over you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he, may he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you his peace in Christ. May he fill you with living water that, that uh, wells up within you into eternal life, both for you and for those you will listen to this week. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen and amen.